Stephen Gilligan's contributions to the field of Ericksonian hypnosis are legendary. He is the author of The Courage to Love, Therapeutic Trances, and The Legacy of Milton H. Erickson. Now, along with NLP developer Robert Diltz, he's created the International Association of Generative Change, a wholly new approach to therapy and coaching. We'll ask him about that and much more today on the Essential Coaching Skills Podcast. You are listening to the Essential Coaching Skills Podcast, a show devoted to uncovering the systems and the secrets that set the best apart, where you learn how to take your coaching clients to the next level, while you grow the coaching practice of your dreams. Welcome to Episode 3, where I interview the great Stephen Gilligan. Since his early days with Bandler and Grinder, and his in-depth experiences and training with Milton H. Erickson himself, no one is perhaps better suited to talk about Ericksonian hypnosis than Stephen Gilligan. Today, we'll find out how all of that leads to his approach to coaching and what we can apply to our own. All right, so we are here. I am here with uh, Stephen Gilligan. If, you, if it's okay if I call you Stephen. Of course. <laughs> Call me anything you want. Just call me. Dr. Stephen Gilligan is um, author of many books, Generative Trance, The Courage to Love, Therapeutic Trances. He's been around as long as I can um, remember knowing about Ericksonian hypnosis. His name was kind of along, you know, mentioned along with it. He um, has a history that just seems like storybook from my perspective. You know, he was in Santa Cruz with Bandler and Grinder in those days. He actually worked with Bateson and worked with Satir, knows them, knew them. Um, it's just amazing. And of course, most famously from my perspective, um, many close encounters with uh, Milton Erickson himself. So the reason I'm asking him here, the reason I'm thrilled to have him here is because of all that. And he has been working in coaching now for the past several years, has a, I think quite unique and fascinating approach to it that he's, I think, generated with uh, Robert Diltz, who many of you know, I'm I'm very influenced by. He, um, in a way, helped me with my business a lot by letting me do sleight of mouth um, in the way that I learned it from oh, Robert. One of the main NLP people. co-creators, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, Stephen, welcome. Hi, Doug. Nice to be here with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so, before we get into ideas and thoughts about coaching could you just tell us a little bit about your history like boy i like i said it, it boggles my mind that you know i've read about all these people but you knew them um mm. you were there with bandler and grinder in the early days of nlp you were you you know sat at the table with you know bateson and stuff and or looked up to him i'm sure because he was very tall from what i understand um yeah. Well, how far how far back do you want me to go? I want you're... you to go all the way back, except for you know, yeah. the beginning. Four four billion years ago, <laughs> there were electrical storms. <laughs> uh, no, I I yeah, I was born and raised in San Francisco, um, Irish Catholic, violent, alcoholic family. Some people say that's redundant, um, but I think I I learned a lot about trance there. Um, I was trained by Jesuits, and then I went to UC Santa Cruz um, in the early 70s. Um, I dropped out of school for a while, kind of had my, you know, um, crash into a, a, a dark place. I came back, and uh, the first day back, I met Gregory Bateson, and the second day back, I met John Grinder, who uh, they were both professors at UC Santa Cruz. Were you, did you meet them because you were in their classes? Yeah, yeah. I had to, uh, like, uh, I, I was on leave of absence. I said, I want to come back. They said, tomorrow's the last day. I said, okay, I'll be down. I drove my Volkswagen van down the California coast. They said, you have to register for courses. Um, I said, okay, give me the, the course list. And they gave them to me, and it was sort of like a Ouija board. You know, I, I just went through, and there was this course by this guy Gregory Batson or Bateson and and uh steps to an ecology of mind uh, and I said okay that sounds interesting and then this course by this guy John Grinder 
uh, Grinder, uh, called The Political Economy of the United States, which, you know, at that point, Grinder was this radical Marxist who was espousing the violent overthrow of the United States government by any means necessary. So uh, I, I really I really connected with both of them. I really resonated with Grinder. Uh, he was he was amazing uh, as a kind of one of my first mentor, uh, and it was within three or four months that he hooked up with Richard Bandler, who was sort of this long-haired uh, hippie in the Santa Cruz Mountains, who was then teaching Gestalt therapy or his version thereof, and and those guys met, and um, out, out of that, the very first pre-NLP. Uh, groups were born, uh, mostly students, you know, like uh, 10 or 12 students uh, that would go uh, Tuesday night or Thursday night. And I, w I was in those very first groups with them. Mm. So I sort of came of age with them. They, out of that, you know, they were applying Grinder's uh, transformational grammar model. He was a linguistics professor to uh, psychotherapy conversations, uh, Fritz Perl's uh, satire. Um, uh, and uh, then Milton Erickson. And Gregory Bateson read their first book, Structure Magic One, and uh, he said, I think you guys are onto something. If you really want to know anything about communication, go study the great purple one out in the desert. And that was Milton Erickson, who was colorblind and, and could only see purple, and at that point, all, you know, wore all purple. Um, and so that, that's how I got to see Erickson within six months. I, I was going out to see Erickson. And what, what year was that? 74. 74. Wow. So I was 20 years old. Yeah. Just like, you know, kind of lucky. And of course, you know, back then it was such a, such a, an incredible time, you know, in the Bay Area, at Santa Cruz and and in psychotherapy for that matter and consciousness it was you know to me oh, the Esalen Institute uh, was happening back then and yeah and I actually lived at Esalen for 10 <laughs> weeks I was able to get John Grinder to give me 15 units for an independent study and I was lived at Esalen the first uh, student work scholar program that they had oh my god and, Pretty cool, pretty cool. Yeah. Wow. So that's that's an incredible journey already, and then uh, you've <laughs> had a pretty incredible journey since then as well. Every day is a winding road. So um, yeah, thank you. That's um, I would love. I could talk to you for days just about that much uh, because it, you've already said some things that I had no idea about and. Um, that's just it's absolutely fascinating to me. And what, I th what I'm thinking our listeners are going to be interested in, since this is the Essential Coaching Skills podcast, is um, how does that relate to, how, how does what you do relate to coaching? How do you do coaching? What is, yeah. for your mind, you know, an essential coaching skill that one needs to be able to have in order to have a conversation the therapeutic nature or coaching nature with a with a person that would help to take them from a place where they have been to a place where they want to be. Right. Well, um, I think of the work that I do and that Robert Diltz and I do, we think about it as a third generation um, approach to creative change. The first generation was traditional therapy, which for various reasons, uh, the time, the history, the culture, um, you know, really got organized around conversations that were problem-based. You, you know, you're sick, you're crazy. Yeah. Um, they looked for, in order to change that, you looked into a person's past. Um, it was a relationship that was primarily hierarchical, and the therapist was really the one with all the knowledge. Um, and it was insight-based, and it was mainly a verbal intellectual engagement um, slowly over time I think you know long before coaching became uh, a its own enterprise in the 80s 
you know, there was this second generation that was developing, I think, from people like Carl Rogers or Milton Erickson. And Carl Rogers was, let's stay in the present moment. And, uh, and, and the change is coming from a conversation, a conversational hookup between the client and the client-centered therapy. Milton Erickson was really doing all this work on get the person to do something different out in the world. Um, a person's sense of the future, a person's sense of their resources um, are really the most important thing. Uh, there was also, you know, the whole consciousness change of, of the 60s. Uh, you know, one of the things that was really shifting was this notion that, that the power is within you, uh, that the expert is, is within each person. So this shift from the, the expert being, you know, s some external person uh, to each person has their own answers, I think was emerging from that whole 60s sort of thing. So I, I th think all that started to converge and it seems, you know, in retrospect, sort of inevitable that something would emerge that we call a second generation change approach of coaching in the 80s. So, um, and again, predictably, it sort of was the taking the opposite position of traditional therapy. Traditional therapy focuses on the past, traditional coaching on the present and the future, uh, traditional therapy focused on explanations, why did this happen, coaching, uh, what is it that you want to do, how can you do that, um, uh, the, the difference be between verbal conversation and actual action in the world, between problems and, and resources. So I, I think of this as the base of what we might call the, the traditional coaching prototype model. So out of that, you know, we see the generative coaching work and, and, and the different versions of generative change work as a third generation approach. You might say it's a coach, traditional coaching plus. Okay. You know, in some ways I, I'd say, that traditional coaching will really help a person achieve competency, uh, to help a person to be able to, to create a, uh, a successful life out in the world. Um, we, we say that, that you can actually do more than that. And, and in certain situations, the type of changes that are needed are something more than that you can get just from verbal talking or conscious acting or, or positive focusing on resources. So we, we think of generative coaching as sort of accepting most of the basic structures of coaching, but adding these, these key uh, additional dimensions, such as, you know, from Milton Erickson and from you know, I, I, I practiced Aikido for many years, this very positive relationship towards these enduring negative patterns that each of us struggles with, you know, and I think it's, it's probably the biggest obstacle that people have, uh, particularly when they're just trying to do positive change from a coaching point of view, you know, that, that it'll work up to a point, but then people hit these, blocks that some of them may be unconscious and and these things really interfere with a person being able to continue to move on some positive path so the coaching traditional coaching i think generally takes more of a just stay stay focused on resources stay focused on positive future uh, take positive action uh, but uh, i think what the ericksonian and the aikido work do is to, is to say these obstacles that you run into are integral parts of any sort of creative unfolding. And if you have a positive attitude and understanding of them, and you have some sort of skill base, they actually take you to a whole new level of your performance and, and, and your, the, the quality of your experience in the world. So that's harkens back to the, title of one of your books, I think it was called the, um, the problem is the solution. Is that 
Yeah, and I think that is the Ericksonian uh, core, you know, that <clears throat> life gives us lots of different experiences, and um, some of them are, are positive and great, some of them are just nasty. Um, and, you know, sort of like the Buddhist idea of having the, the same sort of skillful, curious connection to both the joy and to the suffering of mm -hmm. life. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that that is a real game changer. Yeah, I get that. I get that. And it's, it's I was having a conversation with someone recently about um, what I consider to be basically the uh, central question of NLP, which is like, wow, how do you do that? You know, whether it's whether you're modeling somebody and you want to, you know, take on that ability that they have and say, like, well, how do you do that? So you figure out the strategies for this activity or this uh, ability. Same thing as if there's a problem, you'd be like, wow, how do you do that? You know, That's right. Same kind of question. Up, up to a point, you know, and I think to me where I have a major difference with traditional NLP is there's, there's often some implicit assumption that you can explicitly model all of that stuff. Mm. And I, I think that it is, is so erroneous. You know, I mean, people like Eugene Genlin, who developed the whole sort of felt sense and focusing work, you know, used to say that whatever representation you have of something, mm -hmm. there's always two levels to it. There's an explicit, which is you know stuff that you can represent in, in words and maps and you can consciously say, here it is. Yeah. But that's always held in a deeper implicit space. And the implicit space cannot be consciously known, but it can be, it can be implicitly sensed. And I think any creative person will tell you that if you model them. Right. No, I, I I completely agree with that. Um, and that's where that's by the way that's where the trance work, I think, uh, r really helps and really opens things up tremendously. Right. No, I, I, uh, yes. Thank you. And I I just have to ask you a question here. I don't want to get too off this this topic because I think we're right where I want to be within this questioning. But I just re was reminded of um, a story I think is true at least partially um, of you doing a deep trance identification with Milton Erickson. That's right. That was brought about or, you know, facilitated by both Bandler and Grinder. Yeah. Yeah. And right. then you stayed for a while in a wheelchair? Well, we had, we found a purple wheelchair at some, <laughs> yeah, purple. At some garage sale. It was an old funky, you know, and, and, you know, this was Santa Cruz and this was the seventies and, you know, everything was a, just a really, you know, experiment in consciousness. Yeah, there you go. So, you know, we, we were just interested in, in trance as this way to explore how reality comes into being and how you could shift it and how everything is a variable and what sort of interesting far out states could you get into, not only for the pleasure of it, uh, not only for the sense of really continuing to learn that whatever you think is reality, that's just one possibility. Mm -hmm. and, and so if you're not liking the reality and you go back to the drawing board, go back to that sort of that quantum ocean where an infinite number of alternate realities can be explored. So that was sort of the spirit. And that to me was the great spirit of Milton Erickson. And uh, we were, I was reading all these hypnosis journals just for, you know, what sort of interesting far out realities. And I came across this Russian psychologist named Rykov, who was doing these uh, hypnosis experiments where we'd have people in deep trance become some famous painter, like Rembrandt, for example. And then he would have them do uh, painting from the Rembrandt trance. Uh, and we thought, wow, that's interesting. And so we thought, hey, let's try that. And, uh, you know, this 20 year old kid said, okay, I'll do it with Milton Erickson. And um, we did. I was at uh, Bandler's house, and Gregory Bateson was living on the property. And he came, they, he came lumbering over 
And it was sort of interesting because you know, Bateson and Erickson knew each other for 50 years, so they had quite an extensive relationship. Oh, wow. And um, I did it, and it was, a, it was an extraordinary experience. I think it was extraordinary in the sense of kind of like what an actor, I think, does, mm -hmm. where you're able to step out of your own identity field where all you just assume this is the way things are and you step into another space and you realize wow there's a whole different way of knowing the world but then i think the deep trance identification i did with erickson taught me several things that i don't know if i ever would have gotten to if i was just doing sort of conscious learning that were so helpful to me that the first was you know, at that time, I thought Milton Erickson was just the fastest gun in the West. You know, that he was clever, he was just smarter and faster. And, you know, a lot of the stories about Erickson sort of suggest that, that he was always one step ahead of a person and doing these brilliant sort of creative Playing things. chess on three different levels. Yeah, and the, the, the overwhelming thing that I felt when I was in that state was everything was totally quiet. Mm. So could that be said that might have been your first experience with the generative trance state? No, uh, maybe Grateful Dead concerts. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I grew up in San Francisco. <laughs> right, right. Forgot so it. a, a long, strange trip, but, <laughs> but no, my, my first, uh, I think connection to, how you would work in in a gender transfer intention with an intention for okay. change cool. that, that you had to basically empty everything out and that when you emptied everything out there was this deeper presence there that that had this great uh clarity and in, in wisdom that could be able to to think and experience things at, at a different level the, the second thing you know incidentally was uh, when I opened my eyes slowly it was very clear to me in that Erickson trance quote unquote that everybody was already in a trance mm, really and so I thought okay what technique do I need to do to get this person into a trance and you know I think that's a really non-helpful attitude you know because people can smell manipulation a mile away but everybody was already in a trance. They were in this deep unconscious reality. And so you just needed to not be hypnotized by their front man, by their ego mask, uh, by their persona, and, and be able to make a connection with that deeper level that was, that was in a trance, much more transparent. So, those, those two things, that sense of the base for your deepest creativity is a quiet openness. And second, you, you operate with this assumption that the change you want is already there. You know, we see this working with clients. Most clients have this sense, if only I cannot have this sense, I cannot be happy until I do something different, or if I have a different relationship, or I have the right trance, or if I have more money, or if I, you know, finally get rid of this, you know, uh, insecurity, then I'll be happy. And 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 that sense of I have to do in order to be, I think, is really one of the ways that you keep the state of unhappiness alive. That sense of of getting to a place where you're already happy and you don't need to do anything, I think then allows you to realize the second part, which is I'm okay exactly as I am. You know, I don't have to change anything to be lovable and happy, and I better get my shit together. You know, so why it's, should it's, I get my shit together? If I'm if I'm happy where I am, why why should I get my shit together? Because there's two levels of happiness. One is being, and the other is that we create stuff in the world. 
you know, we, we have these goals and we go on this journey and, and we create uh, something that's positive and that brings, you know, something positive into the world. And that's the second part of being human. Mm. But in order to do that freely and, and to do that at a high level, it's really important to know that you're already whole as you are. So I'm going to come back to that in just a moment. I want to have two quick questions. So when you opened your eyes slowly and you saw that everyone was already in a trance um, and you were in a way embodying Milton Erickson um, or that Erickson trance, if you will, were you paralyzed? Were you able to get out of the wheelchair? Did you stay there voluntarily? How did that come to pass? Well, I would do this for limited periods. Okay. And, you know, the Erickson I knew in the last six years of his life was partially paralyzed. Uh -huh. And so in the trance, that was, that was just the reality of who I was. So I, you know, I, I'm sure that I, I could come out of that reality if I so desired. Okay, gotcha. You know, and I, you know, that's the difference between really a, a positive trance and a negative trance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. You know, in both, you're just totally absorbed in this deep reality. Uh, but in the negative trance, that's all that there is. You are the reality. Uh, but what we're trying to do is get this space where the sort of, what you know, the ego drama world, the world of, of this is happening and this is happening and now I'm angry and now I'm depressed and now I want to kill myself and now I feel happy. Those are, you know, what I would call your performance self. Mm -hmm. And so in a trance, you get deeply, deeply into all the subtle levels of your performance self, the way you think, the way you act, the way you experience things. But in a generative trance, you equally simultaneously have this state of just mindful present. So, so your relationship to your performance self is sort of an affection in an affectionate third person. You know, I was thinking about this um, concept that I learned from you in an Ericksonian training many years ago. Um, and I was always wondering if it came directly, like cognitively, theoretically from Erickson, or if it was something that you kind of gleaned from your experiences with Erickson, that kind of both and state, the both and awareness? Yeah, well, I think it was totally part of Erickson's work, you know, uh, and but I think- it was, but it, I, don't, I don't remember ever him reading him saying anything about that. It just was sort of one of that, that implicit underneath part that you were talking about before that was there. Yeah, you, you, you're right. Uh, but to me, it was so obvious, for example, you know, fellow who's a war veteran who who lost his arm in in the World War II mm -hmm. came to see Erickson because he had excruciating uh, phantom phantom limb. phantom limb pain. Right. And um, you know, like a lot of people who have that, medications wouldn't help. You know, and, and Erickson's response to him was, "Anybody who has phantom limb pain is entitled to phantom limb pleasure." both and. And so he taught the man in a trance, say his left arm was missing, that's where the pain was, that to feel the, the phantom limb pain on the left arm and then in trance to feel phantom limb pleasure in the right arm. Now, would that change something? Of course it would. You know, if the only game in town mm -hmm. is your suffering, right. it, it, it'll, it'll take you down. But if you have a sense of, well, on the one hand, so to speak, I've got pain, and on the other hand, this pleasure, that's a big shift. Right. You know, and then he had the person switch, so the, the pain on the left arm went to the right arm, and, and the pleasure, and, and then down to the feet, and then to the toes, and mm -hmm. so forth. And that was the other thing that I think was so central in Erickson's work, and I think it's one of the main values of trance or creative change, is that everything is a fluid variable. Yeah. You know, I was thinking about that when I was listening to an interview a few years ago by um, 
Oh gosh, the actor Jack Lemon, believe it or not. Yeah. Jack Lemon was being interviewed about uh, acting, about the, this, the act of acting. And he was saying, saying that it's different. A lot of people think that as an actor, you know, he was talking from the days, I think when, uh, you know, they were really into the method, method acting where you got deep right. inside the character and really that's felt right. the that's right. And he said, you know, that's not really what I do as acting. For me, um, as an actor, I, I am aware that I am an actor reading lines and I know my, know my blocking and I know what the next actor is going to say, but I'm also at the same time, the character. So I'm just like a step behind my character at all times. So I'm right. both, That's exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah, I'm both at the same time. Now, I, I think that that may not have been so pronounced in Erickson, you know, partly because of his history you know, we're talking about his paralysis, and his paralysis was a result of this uh, severe polio that he experienced at 17. And for about five years, he couldn't move. And, you know, I would say the conscious mind basically is a product of muscular tension um, and, and mu muscular movement. Uh, so when I say that, your head cocks to the side and then your eyes go down and to the left and, <laughs> yeah, and I'm you're trying to down. figure that one out <laughs> well i mean just you you know think as as i did you know with erickson what would it be like if your consciousness had no connection to to your voluntary muscular muscles yeah that's trapped mm. so that's why we say relax or erickson used to say you don't have to move you don't have to talk because then you begin to tap into, I think, a fundamentally different type of thinking, which I would say is nerve-based. You know, a little bit, you know, I spent a lot of time in China. I think it's what they're trying to get at with the notion of qi, hmm. which is this information energy that's flowing inside the nerves. And so you see in virtually every creative process how important relaxation is as a first step and i think the reason you know you're saying release all of the tension in your muscles so you can in hypnosis and its many cousins one of the central ideas is just let it happen and you hear in creativity well this thought just came to me mm -hmm. or i was in the zone or, you know, I just found myself being able to do this. And there, there is often this sense of what you're talking about, Jack Lemon, where there's two levels of yourself. There's a witnessing, observing that can yeah. gently sort of move with it. But you're, you're therapeutically dissociated from your performance self. So, so your thinking is not primarily coming from muscle tension. So let me just... Um ask you then from a coach as somebody who's endeavoring to be a, a a coach in the world um what would you say is an essential skill for someone to be um the most effective coach for other people in other words to ha help that person move from point a to point b or to manifest what they desire in their life I think the first thing is you, you have to know how to master your own state. Uh, you have to always start with the shift inside of you in terms of your mind body state. So you can stay what, what we call in the, the generative change work, a coach state. That's an acronym to be centered, open beyond the problem, uh, the awareness flow, uh, connected positively. Uh, to a positive future, and H is hospitable, so that you can, whatever shows up, you can welcome. That, that's what allows you to make room for everything that a person is experiencing and be able to hold a space where you can have a sense of acceptance for it all, but also see you can do that in so many, many different ways. And that, that's the basis for the conversation. What, where clients are getting stuck is when they hit their problem, they go into what we call a crash. That's the opposite of the coach. 
constricted, reactive, analysis, paralysis, feeling separate, feeling hurt and hurtful. Yeah. So, so if you, you know, we all, we, we make our living as coaches from our mirror neurons. Yeah, mirror neurons are the part of the right prefrontal cortex that when we see or hear about somebody experiencing something, we feel that in that part of our consciousness as if it's happen as if we are experience are doing that. So when a person goes into crash, if you go into crash as the coach, you're just you're you're just you know pouring gasoline on the fire. Right. So that there's that. And then there are these parts of traditional coaching where you have to make sure that the conversation is organized around a simple positive intention or goal. There's something that you want. That's what this conversation is for. Uh, let's talk about that. That that's a simple question. What do you want? It's not an easy answer. You know, and there's so much sort of hypnotic movement shifting you away from a yes, but that you have to like keep the conversation organized around this 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 simple intention question. And then you have to have a way to invite a person to find their own coach state, to find their own positive state. So they can be with their resources, they can be with the on integrated stuff that can stay with their positive intention so that they they can stay connected to the whole part of their being because they're going to need every part of it to be able to, to, to create something new when you think of coaching um the way that you and robert uh where you just talked about it just now excuse me one second i'm going to cough mute you real quick yeah so, um, do you think of it as a, a, a first conversation or one of many conversations that are happening? Were you, was this coach relationship something that's ongoing or is it a like, you know, traditional NLP, you know, if you will, where we fix it in five minutes and see ya, thanks for coming. Well, uh, I think you fix cats, uh, not people. <laughs> I, you know, er Erickson used to say some things that, you know, I was young, he was an old man. I just thought were sort of just these truisms. Like he would say every therapy is different. He said, I see some people for five minutes, some people for two hours, some people for three years. And he said, there's no single therapy or there's no single coaching. People come to coaching with very different reasons. They, they, what they're interested in, in working with in terms of what level of their behavior, their experience varies tremendously. So, you know, I, I trained a lot in Japanese martial arts and, you know, the, there's this principle first time, last time, which is you approach each session like it's the first session and the last session. And then, you know, you, you see what, what, what happens from there. You know, so it's it's a negotiation that that has m many different possibilities. Hmm. Cool. Thank you. So, my other question, in the sort of focus of this podcast, generally speaking, is that yeah. we're looking for essential skills that a coach needs to have for themselves to a be a good coach for other people, and also essential skills that they need to have in order to actually have a viable, you know, business in the real world. Yeah. Because it's a lovely idea to just go around helping people all the time. Um, and yeah. you need to put dinner on the table kind of thing. Well, you know, um, there's about 60 years of outcome research and therapy, some of which is directly, I think, transferable to coaching. And, you know, one of the, the sort of the guru of the uh, research is a guy named Scott Miller, who's a friend of mine. And, you know, Scott, you know, keeps emphasizing the main thing that works uh, is not the method. It's the relational connection. So a person feels under, listened to, understood that the method is, is uh, applied to a person. And so they feel that it's a process that fits for them. 
Um, secondly, really good practitioners admit their failures more often. Interesting. You know, and you know, we have this pressure, and I really got it from Erickson, that everything should be a total success. Well, that, that's, that's not life. I mean, nine things out of 10 that you try don't work. You know, I mean, we know that about ourselves, but there's a great conspiracy that thinks that everybody else is mostly successful. They're thinking positive thoughts. Uh, you know, everything they do is successful. So we realize almost everything is an experiment. And, and, and from that level, it doesn't matter if the technique works or not. What matters is you made a connection and you're getting feedback. And if you respond to that feedback, then something interesting will happen. And that's, I think, you know, the notion of this, of this relational fit. So to do that, you have to realize almost everything I suggest to you uh, is not going to work. But I know <clears throat> that you can find a way to make it work. And I know that when I'm, you know, presenting these things, that some of the things you're not even going to notice. Some of the things you're just going to just so bulldoze over with your yes, but, yes, but. Some things get a little bit of flicker. I'm not interested or you know, thinking that, that the technique has to work, but, but slowly but surely, everything we're doing brings us into a closer connection. And, and that's when people can change, is that when they're connected to who they are. Mm -hmm. You know, it's when you go, you go through these experiences, you experience failure, you experience whatever, and you shut down. And now you're living a short distance away from yourself. Hmm. And, and you may have a good persona. You may have like a Donald Trump bluster. Uh, but you can't really do anything in the world when you're disconnected from yourself. Hmm. So I say, I, I'm here. I believe in you. I believe that you can be able to, to create these miracles in your life. I totally know that you can be happy. What, it, what it's going to involve is learning how to connect to yourself and to have a kind, creative relationship to everything that you find. And, and that's, that's what I'm going to help you to do. So then you need to have all your methods. You have to be trained in certain methods. You have to have specific goals that you get feedback on. Uh, but those things will produce the changes in people's life that will get you a positive rep reputation. And, and, you know, most of what we do as coaches is word of mouth. You know, you say, well, you know, I, somebody says, well, I heard from my friend that they came to see you for this. So, so you're not trying to sell a method. Mm -hmm. you're, you're really making this way to connect deeply and to have this sense that if you connect to yourself and have tenderness, curiosity, playfulness, fierceness, your life is going to like do wonderful things. So, and by the way, the third thing that Scott Miller says is first is that, that there's a, a, a client-centered fit. The second is the therapist admits failures, the coach admits failures. The third is that the client senses that the coach is on their own personal journey. Hmm. So, so it's not just, okay, next, all right, so you got this problem, I've got a six step reframing technique. But, but, but the client feels, wow, this coach that I'm talking to is that I'm being infected. Yeah. Uh, it's an interesting term in our virus times. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, that life can really be this adventure. Life can be this like incredible thing. And, and when I'm talking to this guy or this person is that that's what I get the sense of. And then I can bring that same attitude to my own life. And that's where, that's where people really take off. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Thank you very much. You yeah. know, it's interesting, you know, as you talk about these things, I, I have these associations of things and, and as a, you know, st standing, living a short distance away from yourself. I, I used to have a poster of that. It was in my office. It was a very funny um, poster. 
but you know, as a musician, um, as a classically trained pianist and as a performer for many years, I often, you know, there were, there were times when I was like nervous or thinking about various things. And, you know, I, I played all the right notes and people liked it and stuff, but it, yeah. it wasn't the same, you know, I knew it wasn't the same. Yeah. But um, there are other times where I just sort of forgot all that. And I was just sort of sharing, you know, sharing this moment with the audience and we were, we were in it together. And it wasn't about the technique. It wasn't about the performance. It was just about this connection that happened through the music. That's and it just, exactly that's when it like, didn't matter if I got the right note or not, you know, it was, it was the right note for that moment. It was just, it was really. Yeah. Amazing. So the, the question is how to train yourself and help your clients learn to get into that state. Right. You know, I've, I've been a little bit surprised at, you know, hearing something as beautiful as, as music or dancing or, you know, acting, and then seeing how people are traditionally trained to do that. Mm -hmm. And it's usually so brutal. Sometimes, that, you yes. know, you have to just play the right note, but that, that, that's a necessary condition but it's not sufficient to play music. That's absolutely correct, yeah. And, and that's what we're talking about is competency plus. Yeah, no, that's absolutely, quick story. When I was doing my senior recital in college, um, my, my teacher was, you know, like all classical music teachers will be, you know, wanting you to get the right notes. It's kind of part of the, <laughs> part, of, part of what this is. This is a Beethoven, it's not a, not, you know, no Brian Sonata. But, um, up to the up to the last lesson, he was like, I don't know, I don't know. You better practice harder. I'm not sure you're going to make it. But then the the day of the recital, he walked in. I was, you know, the auditorium is filling up with people. Um, he walks into the green room. I'm sweating bullets, and he he he's, looks like he's been drinking. You know, he's just like smiling. It's like, hey, you've done the practicing. Go out and have fun. And I thought, who are you? <laughs> What have you done to my teacher? Where is he? Uh, but it was, it was, that's what the message was, you know, and I, and I, I took a few minutes to take that in and uh, I didn't do it at first. I was too nervous. But um, after the first piece was over, I was able to sort of settle down and, and do that. Cool. And it was quite an extraordinary experience. Yeah. So it is that you gotta, you gotta have the right notes. The ballet dancer has to point their toes and do all those things. Totally. And, totally. And you at know, the same it's time, hard work being spontaneous, right? Yeah, right. And so then, you know that's that where is. this thing, you know, where the 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 relational connection, or you know, of all the things that Erickson, you know, used to say, I, I think his number one principle is life is to be enjoyed. Hmm. You know, he said, no matter who you are and what you're doing, there's there's one chunk of life that's hard that's difficult uh, and you can't avoid that. So you wanna make sure that you have enough fun that at the end of the day, you have a sense of, well, you yeah, know, there was those really difficult things or those difficult people I had to talk with or those, you know, really boring tasks. But wow, you know, uh, on the, the whole scope of the day, that was interesting. You know, so that, that's the sort of the state that we need to train that allows the techniques that we are trying to master, whether it's music or, you know, how to be a good parent or uh, how to, you know, uh, run your business. Well, there's a lot of technical stuff that, that you have to really be able to give yourself to, to studying and improving every day. But, but you've got to, find a way to let the X factor kick in. And, and so th those two levels, you know, they're basically the sort of the left brain of learning, you know, the precision of the maps, of the skills, of the practice. Uh, and people who are really great, they practice more than other people. You know, they have gifts, but they practice more. You know, there's no substitute. You know, so you hear, you know, somebody say, I learned that you can just spend five minutes a day with this approach. And, you know, no, I don't think so. You know, people who are sustainably successful, they practice more. But to be able to practice more, you have to do it in a way that you're having fun. 
because otherwise you'll have rebellion in the ranks. You know, you get procrastination. Uh, you start getting angry at people. You become a control freak. Uh, you become a bureaucrat. You know, all in all, you're just another brick in the wall. <laughs> you know, so so we're we're trying to like unite those two, that sort of left brain and the right brain, the head and the heart. Yeah. And then you you realize I'm most everything I do is going to fail, but I'm I'm continuing to stay present with an intention to succeed. So all I need is one out of ten things to succeed, and that'll that'll move me forward. And most importantly, no matter what, I'll enjoy it. You know, leave it all on the map. Yeah. Very beautiful, Stephen. Thank you so much for being here. My pleasure, Doug. It was uh, a meaningful moment for me to have you here and a great discussion. I, I would love to have you back sometime in the future. There are just 5,000 other questions that occur to me, but I'm trying to just say, let's leave it there for now. Um, one last quick question, though, is where do people find you? What, what's the best way to get hold of you to learn more about generative trance? and www.stephengilligan.com. That's www.stephengilligan.com. Operators are standing by. Uh, there's also uh, this, this group that I developed with Robert Diltz called the International Association for Generative Change, which is iagc.info, uh, which is the second website. And you know, we're starting a new, a new one. Uh, because like most of us, we're being pulled into the virtual world. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, last year I was on the road 230 days. Oh In, insane, insane. And uh, who knows the next time I'm going to get on an airplane. Uh, but, you know, I, I think there's this, the, not only the necessity, but this opportunity to really do uh, and, and take advantage of the technology that has emerged to do all, all this virtual learning. Yeah. So that's going to be uh, a, another website. So things like your podcasts are just little uh, uh, drop, little pebbles dropped in the great, great pond. I'm happy to be a pebble. <laughs> Once again, thank you so much. I appreciate you so much. My pleasure, Doug. Well, that's our show for today. Thank you so much for joining me. If you want any more information about today's show, please visit our website at www.essentialcoachingskills.com. Be sure to tune in again next week for our next episode and discover even more about the systems and the secrets that set the best apart. Mm -hmm.